All right, so if we have the project open in Notepad, you take a quick look at it in your web browser to remind us at what point it's at. Last week was a long time ago. Let's remember what our project looks like up to this point. So I've started it up. Got those rollovers, the design, and so forth. Well, to remind you with, with our goal, vmcinc.net slash marvel, looks pretty much the same. On both, there's the version up on my server. There's our version. Well, there's still some things we want to do, like fonts. We'll talk about fonts, how to have any font we want. But the big idea is to make this mobile friendly. If I've got a monitor that's, you know, that big, the project looks nice on that size. If a person is on a device that's smaller, you know, something like this, it might look nicer that way. You see how it changes. The tabs up there don't work anymore on a small device. They've changed to be horizontal. When you roll over, it's more obvious there. Featured posts, simple text gets centered. The uh, graphic is also centered as you keep going down. Well, the sidebar, the sidebar no longer works on the side. There's no side space on a mobile device. It's been moved down. And just for a little bit of different visual interest, the um, straight lines or solid lines have become dashed lines. Contact information is also centered. Actually, at different screens, if I were to have like a um, an iPad-sized screen, maybe something like that, the screen also changes. If I have a different kind of device, it would also change that way. So this is a, a responsive website. It changes. It responds to the size of the person's device. That's what our goals are for for today to make it mobile friendly. The first thing we'll do is just for fun, let's first do the part about um, fonts. In my example project here, I have a particular font at the top and then different fonts for the headings. We saw that we can set fonts in the CSS, but we had a limitation. Here I chose, for example, Georgia Times. I'll take that. I think that's fine everywhere now. Um, so we had these basic fonts that we were able to choose from, but I would want a variety of fonts. I would want more interesting fonts. We were able to do that via online fonts. So go ahead and open up your web browser. And we'll go to the address. Let's see. We'll go to the address fonts.google.com. This is one of a variety of places where we can get online fonts. Is that sign in sheet run out yet? in a little bit late, remember to sign in. I've got the sign-in items right here. We'll do that later. But for the moment, uh, fonts.google.com. The whole point of this site is there are about 800 
fonts that are available for us to access on our web projects. The beauty of this is that these fonts are up on a server and it doesn't matter if the person has the font installed on their computer or not because traditionally a person needed that particular font installed on their computer to see it. If I chose the Chiller font, it looks really good on a Windows machine, but when they visit on a Mac, they can't see it. Here, these fonts up online, Roboto, Pangolin, etc., anyone can access these as long as they have an internet connection, and then the fonts will show up. So, we have on the right side categories, serif, sans serif, display, handwriting, and monospace. If I turn them all off for a moment and just look at serif, Serif fonts are in the style of Times New Roman, relatively boring, but very utilitarian. They look nice, they're readable. So something like Merriweather, I may choose for my P's, my paragraphs. Reading lots of plain paragraph text is difficult with a fancy font. So a serif font is designed to be readable. Serif fonts are the ones that have these like little accents. Notice this P right here has a little flourish here and here. There's technical terms for this in typography. These little flourishes. Serifs. These little items. Even that G right there. That's not necessary, but it looks nice. Sans serif, sans without serif, are like Arial style fonts or Helvetica style fonts in that they're more solid. They don't have that <coughs> ornamentation. Look at the, um, usually they don't. The G still have, seems to have one here. But notice everywhere else, like the P, uh, P right there, that doesn't have that extra styling in the descender there. Se serif and sans serif are good for blocks of text that uh, you want people to read. Well, they look a little boring. So that's why we've got display fonts. These look really nice as an H1, as an H2, not as a paragraph. So that's going to be pretty hard to read, especially on a small screen. And then also handwriting are often hard to read in, in long blocks, so they look good for headings, text that has become large. Monospace are are kind of a mixture of them in a sense because it looks like an Arial or a sans serif font. Um, I may see other ones that look like a um, serif font, like Anonymous Pro. Well, the difference is that they're monospaced in that each letter takes up the same amount of space, regardless of its size. The letter I is, is normally a thinner letter, but here it seems to be taking up the same amount of space there. Monospaced, single-spaced. So if I need fonts that take up exact amounts of space, I could go with a monospace font. The basic fonts that we were using about Times, New Roman, and Georgia, and all of that, we'll keep those for most of our text, but then we'll get fancy with um, some of these interesting fonts for headings, the way we use this. Go to any of these sections. I'm going to go to display. Find any font that's interesting to you. I'm going to try audio wide and then click the plus symbol to add it to your sort of basket. And then they'll give us the code to be able to use it. So any of these that you like here Shrikend or audio wide, Chewy. I'm going to go with audio wide. Click the plus. There's other settings that you can do. You can play with that later but I'll uh, click the plus to select. It pops up down there, it says I got one family of fonts selected. You can click the bar down there. Embed code, customize the code, different things about it. Which way do you want to <coughs> apply it in your, in your site? We have the standard and we have the import. We'll keep it on standard. We need to add this bit of code to our project. And then to use it, we simply 
refer to it, depending on yours, however it tells you to do it. What does this code look like right here? It's a link, and it tells you it's a style sheet. Technically, we're connected to a style sheet file on the Google server. So as long as a person has a connection to the internet, they will be able to access this external file and load up this unique font. Whatever your code says, we'll go ahead and select it and copy it in the standard box. To embed your selected fonts into a web page, copy this code into the head of your HTML document. So I've copied that. I'll go back to Notepad. At the top, we've got head, meta, title, style. We've got embedded style. And as it will be much more important later on, the order of this stuff matters. What I want to do is early on reference the CSS file, that external file, so that I can use it later in the project. Therefore, before my style block, before line 6 or so, give yourself a new line 6. Before the embedded style, I'm going to paste the code that they, they gave me. <coughs> this then sort of connects to the server to be able to use the font and then if I actually want to apply it in my site it further says, use the following CSS rules to specify these families. So font family, which we've seen before, the name of your font to be safe in quotes. They use single quotes, double quotes, works just fine, uh, comma, cursive. So this is saying, try to display the audio-wide font in the project. Comma. If that one doesn't work for whatever reason, then choose whatever cursive font is embedded into the device or your website. You can go off and see the Getting Started Guide on your own. But in my case, it's called Audio Wide. Note how it's spelled for mine. And that means I need to go anywhere into my code where I want to use that, maybe to make it obvious. Header H1 font family, etc., etc. I will add audio-wide comma. Try audio-wide first. If that doesn't work, then try Helvetica. If that doesn't work, then try Arial. End up with sans serif. It's saying for mine also cursive. It gave it to me in quotes. If, if it's one word, I can omit the quotes if I want. I'll save two bytes. Notice in, in the example, it also did single quotes. And everywhere that we're using, we're using double quotes. I haven't really mentioned it, but really this is valid to use single or double quotes in your code as long as you're consistent. It'll make more sense and it'll be more important later in JavaScript. But in quotes, just to be safe, I put that there. In my case, I didn't really need it because it was one word. If it was called something like Amazing Audio Wide Pro, I should put that in quotes definitely to make sure it understands it. I'm going to save it and run it. And I should get a brand new interesting font up on my header. Let's pause there. Does that work for everyone? If it didn't, make sure you copied and pasted exactly the code that it gives you for the CSS link, and then apply it exactly as it tells you down there.
we can embed multiple fonts. If we copy and paste another line of code for a different font, we can use it. There is a trick to double them up on one line, however. The trick is, if you're looking here, let's say I wanted to use Audio Wide and Shriekland. I added two fonts. If I look carefully at the code, the name of one font, pipe character, the name of the second font, a pipe character is shift backslash. On your keyboard, you have a vertical line right below the backspace, above the enter, you have a backslash. You have a vertical line, the pipe character, shift backslash. I could copy and paste this, but if you know that, you can use one line of code to embed multiple Google fonts, you just separate them with pipes to use them. It's the same sort of thing. Reference the name of your font wherever you actually need to use it, and it will apply. Let's say I want to use Coda. In my case, I'm already using audio wide. So notice it's connecting to a secure server to the fonts subdomain at googleapis.com slash CSS folder, the query family equals audio wide. And I wanted to use another one, I, for, I already forgot its name, uh, Coda. So pipe, which is a vertical line, back, shift backslash, Coda. Now wherever I want to use Coda, maybe for my H2 and H3s, font family, colon, Coda, and the rest. Let's see, header H1, article, article H2 group, article H3, maybe I want to put those fonts on the sidebar. Where's my sidebar? Aside H2, That might work. So, in my case, aside section H2. I never defined a font there. I'm going to add font dash family. In my case, coda, comma, cursive. that gives me is on the side I'm getting a different font I want to also use that font for featured posts see if you can figure that out font for the H1, for those H2s. Yeah. One thing to be careful of once uh, we learn these things, uh, sometimes we go overboard, that I, I put lots of fonts all over the place. That's a beginner mistake. Uh, you want to keep it to two different fonts, maybe three. I want a plain, a rather plain font for the main readable areas. I can change these, but then it's getting too small, so I have to be careful. This font might not look so good that small. So plain text there, whatever that is, Arial, Times, Roman, whatever. A nice readable serif or sans serif. And then one or two other styles for the headings. I could have kept that one of audio work 
on all of these headings. That'd be fine. The difference is sizes and colors. <coughs> Just for some visual interest, I chose a different font for the H1s and the H2s, but I don't want to go overboard and choose different fonts, a lot of different fonts. That's a bit amateur. So that's how that looks. Anyone need a little help? Did everyone get those fonts changed up? So this, uh, this style of, this way of adding fonts to your site is very popular. Um, the catch is that the project needs um, to have an, a connection online to be able to load this font. Later on we'll do another method where we can actually download the fonts and bundle them in our project because maybe we have a project, uh, a mobile app eventually, that can work offline, that you don't have an internet connection. And fonts here are icing on the cake. It shouldn't break your app if these fonts don't show up. <coughs> but later on, we will look at a way about how to embed <coughs> the fonts into the app. Right now, we're relying on an internet connection. Okay, so what we're going to focus mostly on today, and it will take a while, is uh, making this site responsive, making this site respond to the user's screen and change itself accordingly. What I also want to do is this project is starting to get um, pretty big. It's got lots and lots of lines of CSS and relatively little of HTML. The whole project is about 233 lines, and most of the code is CSS. Uh, by the end of the day, uh, maybe we'll do it now, uh, I want to move this over to, a, to its own file. We usually want to have the divisions of that an HTML file is just HTML, a CSS file is just CSS, and a JavaScript file is just JavaScript. I think we'll do that first. We'll move our CSS code into its own separate file. Uh, that's often the best way to do it. So first let's go up to the File menu, New. File Save As. Be sure you're saving this file in the same location that you're saving your HTML file we're going to need to connect our HTML file to the CSS file. The easiest way to do that is if the HTML and the CSS files are in the same folder. Right now I'm putting everything into a folder in my flash drive called Mobile Apps 1. Whatever folder you're using. So keep your HTML and your CSS files in the same folder. And we're going to call this styles.css. Make sure the save as type is cascading style sheets style.css save me as cascading style sheets Notepad gives you then two tabs, a tab for your HTML file, a tab for your CSS file. We can look at these tabs side by side. If you right-click a tab and select Move to Other View at the bottom, that'll give you code side by side. So right-click the tab, Move to Other View. You can also do move to a new instance. That'll open it in a completely different notepad screen. But here, move to, an, to other view. From the HTML file, I want to select everything in the style block, but not the style tags. 
I want to select it all to cut and paste. So I'm going to select everything in the style, but not the style tags. So I've selected, in my case, from lines 8 down to 162. So nearly 160 lines of CSS code not the style opening and closing tags. I'm going to select all the style code, right click, cut, not copy, cut, and paste into the CSS file. So my HTML file on the left, I took out all the CSS. I pasted it into its own CSS file, Oh, and I get the color coding, because it recognizes it as a CSS file. This style block here is no longer necessary. We're not going to have internal style, embedded style. So we don't need style there at all. So here in the... HTML file, I completely removed all the style, all 160 lines of style. I moved it over to the CSS file. Cut and paste. Not copy and paste, cut and paste. The alignment of these things may be off. Doesn't matter, but aesthetically, I want everything aligned to the left, perhaps. One way to do that is to uh, right click select all. When lines of code are selected in the CSS file, I can press Tab to tab everything over. I can Shift Tab to tab it back. And this is completely just for, for looks. But by selecting everything and then Shift Tabbing, it'll push it back to the left side. I'm working with two different files, HTML and CSS. Therefore, I need to save them both. They both have the indicator that they need to be saved. A quick way to save more than one file, we have right there the icon, Save All. We also have File, Menu, Save All, Control-Shift-S, So I need to remember to save everything, save both files. And if I run this, I need to remember to run it from the HTML file. If I run it from the CSS file, I get CSS. It tells you which file you're working on because the tab is highlighted. So I've saved both files. I'm on my HTML file. I run it. It looks plain and boring, just like early on. All the magic is the CSS at this point. So we need to connect the HTML file to the CSS file. We have a, a starting point, link href, a Google CSS file. So this code here is something similar that we'll use to connect over to our CSS file. In the head, we'll create a link tag, href attribute to something, and then also a rel attribute. We saw up here href pointing over to some web address where there's a CSS file, and then rel relationship. This is a style sheet. <coughs> the name of your file is your href, because I kept my CSS file in the same folder as my HTML file, styles.css. Just to check mine, I called mine styles, plural, CSS. If you called it singular, 
that's fine, but remember to call it your singular. If you call it my style dash 2017 dash 2 dash 14, which is perfectly fine, remember to name it that here. And the rel, the relationship is this is a style sheet. Now if you save it and run the HTML file, all your styling should come back. <coughs> we'll pause here. Make sure your CSS code is in a CSS file only. And make sure your HTML file is connected to the CSS file. And it should look like this, just like before. If it doesn't, call me over. Anyone need any help? That's the specification that we're telling it there's a link between this HTML file and a link to the file and it's a style sheet. And in the top of it, our file has a normal model. Well, it will be what on the intro, whatever your style, whatever your file name is, and then route has to be a Thank you. 
All right, so what we've done here is we've uh, moved our code to an external file. This is often a better way to do this than having it embedded in one file. Separation of um, concerns is the fancy way of saying that. What I want to do at this point then is focus on um, the mobile-friendly aspect of things. We need to set what are known as breakpoints. At a certain point, the, uh, the view should break, uh, meaning depending on the size of your screen, things should change, you're on a different size screen. So we can target these different sizes of screens with a little bit of CSS code. And what those different sizes of screens will be then are going to be blocks where I can then redefine my CSS. If the screen is at a certain size, then change the background color like this, or change the font size like that, so we can target the different sizes. Let's set these common breakpoints and then we'll fill in the code. What we'll do first is... I don't want to do it side by side anymore. I want to just focus on one view of CSS. I can go back to the right click, move to other view. All of this code that is happening right now applies to the whole site, regardless of the person's monitor size. I then want to add four common breakpoints for different size devices. At the very end, let's go to the very end of your code, you just in the CSS file. We'll type the at symbol media space all. We can target different media, uh, screens, 
printers, projectors, phones. Here we're saying any media, basically, any device, space, and we're saying ways that we could use this are saying if we're on a mobile device and the mobile device is this size, do the following. I want to apply this to any device because I may have a big monitor or a small screen on the person's laptop. It doesn't matter what device they're on space. I'm going to say in parentheses min-width colon 1024px. I'll explain that in a moment. After the parentheses, space and, more parentheses, max-width 1600px. Outside of the parentheses, open curly brace, close curly brace. This is a media query. I'll put a comment here above it. Comments in CSS. This is media query for a large screen. A query, a question. It's going to check what kind of media is this project currently being looked at. We've said all, so any media. Other possibilities here, <coughs> commonly you see screen. Because the alternatives are we could have an audio version of the website. Media audio. Media braille. Media projector but all is, is common. So any screen and it has to have this minimum size and that maximum size. So yes, these brand new amazing, you know, 4K screens, this is falling outside of that view. Uh, I'll come back to that later, but we're saying here a pretty big size screen. Um, if a person is on this big size screen, everything that follows in here will be CSS specifically for those screens, for those sizes. We'll fill in those details in a moment. I want to continue to set these breakpoints. So after the curly brace, at media, all, and this time we're going for a minimum <coughs> width of 768 pixels and a maximum width of 1024. And that's a block of curly braces. What's that? What's that? Question? This size is uh, common for many types of tablets. So here we're saying any device and the minimum is 768, the maximum is 1024, commonly for tablets. Right here, common tablet size. <coughs> As tablets and, and smartphones uh, and laptops and everything get better and better screens, 4K screens and all of that, these are going to need to be rewritten. Uh, but we're, we're in the transitional phase about those screen sizes. <coughs> so then after that media query, here's another media query. Media all and min with 480px and max width 768px. This is commonly higher and mobile devices. The, the point of all of these is to target these different screen sizes. So the CSS, it's kind of interesting that it's uh, smart enough, but uh, to check what's the size of the device. And then any code within those curly braces is the code that is activated, so to speak. It's not that the actual CSS does anything, really. It's actually the web browser 
that does the processing of it. The web browser reads it and sees, oh, there's a query here about 480 pixels, let's use that code. There's one more. Well, again, if you have experience in other languages, the big difference here, there's no compiling going on here. This is an interpreted language. There are nitpicking differences. The way that you're saying it technically is not, <coughs> is not right. Um, so it's hard to get away from thinking about compiled languages and classes and all of that. This is different. But really, it's the web browser or the mobile device itself that's checking the code, and then it makes a decision based on what the code is here. It doesn't actually compile it to do anything different. It just looks at the code here and applies this code. Yes? The reason why we might have it down here is because we have a full amount of code already that defines everything in a general size. Then we specify it to, us to different dimensions. So we need to fine-tune it after the basics are set up. Second question? Yeah, and then again, uh, you know, the paradigms of this language, it's not, it's not even, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a styling, it's styling markup. It's not exactly even like code that's compiled or it's interpreted. So one more. It's for the lower end devices. Lower end mobile size. Now be careful here. Media all and max width. We're only going to do one here. Max width 480. This one was binding between a couple of sizes. 480 to 768. If my screen size falls anywhere between here. This one now is max width. Be very careful here. People make this mistake. This is a max width. Now we're saying anything smaller than 480, apply this styling. So we have the general one at the top. All of that code. Try to apply all of that code. And then as the browser realizes, or somewhere it's realized, this size monitor is this. Let's then apply this following code. This is when we fine-tune it. We could, people often think, well, what if I, what if, if this is the biggest size, why don't I just put all of this code here? That would kind of work. The problem is that if we put all of our existing code in this, it will only apply to those dimensions. We would then have a completely blank design in any other, any other size. Here, this is the cascade again. Apply all of this, no matter the size of the screen, and then fine-tune it per size. So each of these will get progressively more detailed in that if we're on a big size screen, we only need a few tweaks. If we're on a smaller tablet, a couple of tweaks. Mobile devices, we need to tweak it more. Smallest mobile device, the most tweaks, because it's the most different from the base view. What if this is not the beginning of the To answer the question again, it is afterward because we need to apply all of this basic styling first and then we need to fine-tune it as the different sizes. Um, if we put this first, it, there's nothing to apply yet. It does go in order. It has to be processed from top to bottom. So basic styling and then detailed styling. <coughs> the first thing I want to do here is uh, within the large screen. Uh, here we then start to define each of these footer, paragraphs, whatever. 
for media of 1024, we really only need to affect the wrapper. We're going to redefine the wrapper. We said at the very top what the wrapper is, and now here we're going to say it's a little bit different. We're going to say the width of the wrapper, 75%. At the top, we said 960. That might not be the best size for these types of screens. Instead, we want to grow or shrink the screen depending on the size of the um, of the of the person's device. That's all we really need to do for that screen size. We could tweak this more if we wanted to, but all of the code at the top still applies. We're just then rewriting. This is the order of it also. It'll make more sense as we get more detailed. Let's go to then tablet size. In the tablet size, we will say body. font dash size, 1.25m. Uh, we're making the size of the basic text slightly larger for a smaller device. Uh, a bad design on a mobile device is that the text is too small. And oftentimes you can't zoom in or zoom out in an app. It's the proper size for the device. So slightly bigger than normal often works well on a mobile device, tablets and smaller. <coughs> Line height, 1.3m. Since we made the text a little bit larger, I also want to make the space between the lines a little bit larger. After this body, we'll do wrapper. And here we'll say width 95%. You have a smaller screen. Don't leave all of that empty space on the edges. Stretch out the wrapper to fill out almost the whole size of this of that tablet screen. Mm -hmm. This is this is still affecting HTML, and this is the whole thing, yes. One more item here. Nav list items. When you're dealing with a tablet size, things are smaller. So I also want to change this up a little bit. Line height, 1.5m. The way to really test the CSS media queries is to see the project in actual devices. We've got lap, we've got tablet or desktop computers here. It'd be nice to look at this in an actual tablet or an actual mobile device. We can't quite do it because it's not uploaded to any real server. We can, however, use the web browsers in a couple of different ways. Go ahead and run it in Firefox. Remember to run your, CS, your HTML file. If you run your CSS file, you get a screen full of CSS. Just go back to your HTML and run your HTML. And then resize your screen a bit. If your monitor is that big and you scroll it down a little bit, eventually you should have seen a jump right there. At a certain point, this is activating the 75% wrapper size. At a certain point, when I get small enough, it jumped to the 95% width, and the text got a little larger. So right at that point, I crossed 700... What do I cross? I crossed 768... No, um, no I crossed 1024. When I'm at 1025 pixels, it's going to be 75% of the size of the screen, the wrapper. When I'm 1023, 
right there, it jumps to 95% of the screen, and the font, the text gets bigger. I'm not quite liking that size, actually. Depends on your font. But you can tweak that later. So one way to start testing this is to simply resize your screen. At a certain point, we've never defined the rest, these other media queries, so it, it just doesn't work. Then it's too small there. It stops paying attention. Is there a way we can interrogate the browser to see if we're at 769? Yes, we'll do that right now. So here, I can't quite tell what sizes we are at. Um, Chrome has a slightly better way to test these. Let me just confirm. They might have updated it. Um, we can try this. Let's see how this works. Here in, in, um, in Firefox, hit F12 to go to your developer's tools. I'm going to maximize my screen and hit F12. Press F12 on the keyboard to bring up your console and the inspector. On the right side, on the strip of icons on the right side, responsive design mode. If you click that icon near the gear, responsive design mode, your screen changes to tell you here's your device, quote unquote, 320 by 480. Here's your screen at 1280. You can type your own values, of course. And here it is at 980. I think the Google Chrome one is better, and we'll look at it in a moment, but most of them have this now, yes. This you can, uh, if this panel is in your way here, you can move it to the, to the right side. You can also undock it. Now don't close it because then you lose your icons. But if you move it to the right there, sometimes that's useful to see it that way, depending on the size of your screen. And then I can go to different sizes. You can also do here a rotation. If I am, let's say, at 360 by 480, well, let me put it back to like 980. If I'm at 980, something like that, 980, and I switch to the icon of the inspector. They lose their name once they're on the side there. We've got inspector, we've got console. If I'm on, I'm on inspector and I select the wrapper, if I've used the, the selector here and I've selected the element that is the wrapper, it should also tell you here, we are currently using the media query. The wrapper is set to 95%. Originally, wrapper, back on line 15, was 960, crossed out. It doesn't apply anymore. Now on line, whatever line this comes up to, now we've got a media query in effect, or oh, line 170. Here. Style CSS file, line 170. We affected the body also. So if you've selected the body in the inspector, your CSS again tells you. Down here, the body had an original size of fonts. Right there. Originally on line one, I set the body to be font size one, line height one and a half. Crossed out because then they were rewritten later down on the code, and this shows it backwards. In most inspectors on all the browsers show it backwards. The last code is at the top. And we wrote it in Notepad at the bottom. But that's, that's happening at line 166. That's happening at line 1. Things that are crossed out often mean that we rewrote the code elsewhere. 
and can we like trace that filter rules containing this property if you click that it looks like it'll highlight everywhere that's useful so if you click the little filter icon it tells you where that happened at turn that off filter so font size was first affected here and then through hundreds of lines of code later it was affected there and that's simply filtering for a search term yes mm -hmm. yeah If I go to different sizes, if I go down to a 360 size and I select the div wrapper, there's no code targeting it yet. We haven't written it yet. It's still saying, your wrapper is set to 960, too big for this size. And so we've got a media query to target that size down on line 180. I'm going to run this in Chrome. I like the Chrome responsive view a lot better. Let's check this one out for a moment. Go back to Notepad and run your HTML file in Chrome. F12. Tab appears on the right, it seems. You can also move it below um, somewhere. Move it below with those three dots and choose the bottom if you want. Now Chrome also tells you in the corner as you resize this thing actual values of your screen right there. Anyway, I'm going to keep that on the right. And the way it works in Chrome to do this responsive checking is there's a little icon right there, right above doc type, for responsive mode toggle device toolbar responsive mode. If I click that, it tells me I'm in responsive mode, 480 size. What I really love here is it's very subtle. If you hover your mouse over these elements here, these are different sizes, presets. If you click there, well, that's your mobile size 320, next level up, your mobile 375, your mobile 425, next level up a tablet 768 and you should then see down here the media query is in effect line 166 next level up above that now we've got a laptop 1024 click on that it says you've got your laptop media query active next level up above that a large laptop 1440 we're at you know 90% or whatever and then even higher than that it's gonna look at a 4k screen so you got a 4k screen your your website will look like that but we need a media, media query for that I think that's the highest yeah that's the highest level but then all of these are different sizes I believe it's large yes but even at 1440, that's not large anymore. 1920 is large now. So things are changing. But probably on the next update, that'll have that change too. And if there isn't a size here that is working, I can put a, a size here. I want a 1920 size screen. Is it 1920 by 1080 HD size? That's how that's going to look. What I also like is that this zooms you in and out easier than Firefox to kind of show you here's a here's a tablet size and it's 75% of the size of the web browser. What I like even more is what about if you click that responsive triangle? You can preview it on different devices too. And these will also then give a user agent We'll talk about that later. But here now, here's how my device looks on a Galaxy S5. It's these dimensions, it's this height, and so forth. Yes? I noticed that even though it's Galaxy S5, the resolution is super small. Yeah, that's pretty low, isn't it? These are these are up there in higher quality. Yeah, like, the next 16, I have it, it's like 2560 by 1440, but you click on that, it's like... Yeah, it's really small it might be uh, it needs to it needs an, an internal update or something uh, I'm not sure why there it is that low quality but the proportions are good um, and these and the 
young fire pot or whatever smaller version like that because they get cut off. Mm -hmm. Where that just gets this crazy. Now also because it is set it might be also set to window right here. If that is set to hundred percent, you know, it didn't actually, yeah. So it's not it's not perfect. It didn't actually cut it off like Firefox, but it's still that's a very good way to check your devices when there are media queries. Right now it seems to be ignoring it um, unrealistically. So when we have these media queries fully set up, it should work really good. Yes? Yes. Um, this goes back a little bit to the question a moment ago in that it's not fully letting you test it completely. We saw in Firefox when I was at a smaller size things were cutting off. Here it's completely forcing it to stay on screen so it's not quite as realistic. Um, as we add more of these media queries this will this should work better. Um, but if there are overlapping things we, we would see it and we would be able to select the elements to, to work with them. We have a few sizes here, and then we also have edit, and that gives us a bunch of other ones that are not active. Like if I want to open up a BlackBerry Z30 for some reason, I can select that. Now I've got the BlackBerry device. This also works for other websites. If I keep it on a like a Nexus 5X and I type the address google.com, I'm going to see a real website in that responsive view, like that device. So if we were looking at the example site, vmcinc.net slash marvel, it also gives it to you in a different sort of if you're in one of those devices, it gives you the interactivity like a tap. Notice there's no rollovers anymore. Well, you don't get rollovers when you're on a real device. You just tap and it goes. You only have rollovers when you're on a device, like a laptop. So if you're in responsive mode, that's when you might see that result. So I wanted to show you both of these in uh, Chrome and Firefox. You can open up the, the other devices as well, the other browsers, to check out their inspectors, run Internet Explorer, for example. Depending on which version you have, you should still be able to hit F12. And we then get developers tools right there. Explorer console. Um, the emulation responsive, there's the responsive tool. So you want to see it. Not that great, but. So we still need more work here, of course. We need to fine-tune this. So think about it in terms, here's all my basic styles. We then need to rewrite and fine-tune it depending on the device. We've only touched on two. We're going to spend a lot of time on the higher-end mobile and the lower-end mobile. And um, we'll take a break first. 7.25. Let's take a break until 7.35. And then we'll be back to edit these devices. Yeah.